So this is one of those sermons, and I apologize, Aaron, for readjusting it, moving it all up. One of those sermons that I have been waiting eagerly to preach. Um, I've been kind of giving hints at it since day one, um, talking about when we get to this point. I said there were five uh, visionary messages that, that I was going to do as a series, and then Pastor Don was filling in a lot of praxis. Uh, you heard him mention that a few times, practical applications to those points. Uh, and that's the way we kind of constructed it, and that's the way it's gone. And we've reached the fifth and final kind of visionary message. And if you go on the website, you'll see them broken down that way. There's five visionary messages. It was about uh, encountering the kingdom, the kingdom at hand, keeping the kingdom at hand as the church, as the body of Christ. It was about achieving oneness with Christ. It was Christ, the new man, the new me, that kind of my life for his, laying our life down and letting his life shine through us. And Pastor Don uh, picked that up again last week and talked a little, even a little more about that. So that oneness with Christ, that's a great mystery, a divine mystery um, that we, we get to experience and encounter. And then the third one was, was encountering the Spirit. We did that a few weeks ago. The indwelling of the Spirit, where the Bible talks about it like a rushing water, a rushing spring, leading and welling up to eternal life, both in this life and in the next. And then I did a, a kind of a sermon on our response to this, to these three types of encounter um, with the kingdom and with, uh, with Son, Christ, and with the Spirit. And we kind of said repentance is the key that unlocks the kingdom's gate for our heart, right? It un it really, it unlocks our heart, right? Kingdom's gate is there beckoning us, but it unlocks our heart. And, and we noticed how every time Jesus said, you know, repent and believe that the kingdom is at hand. The kingdom at hand was the gospel, the good news. Repent and believe the gospel. Believe that that kingdom is attainable to you in the here and now. And so repentance is kind of our response to those three encounters. This is the, the final one, the fifth one, and it's also about our response. And it attempts to answer the question, how then shall we live? How then shall we live? Probably one of the oldest illustrations um, that any pastor could give, it dates back even into ancient times, right, is uh, you have to build a house on a good what? Foundation, Foundation. Foundation right? That's not a, a new illustration probably that's foreign to any of you. You have to build your house on a good foundation and what you do I am I do not claim to be a carpenter I do not claim to be a builder uh, my father's here he has a lot more experience than me on that Chris Richards is here he has a lot more experience than me on that so if I say something inaccurate from the carpenter side of the thing please just tell me quietly when no one else is around but I will I will do my best to make sure this is this uh, analogy works so you have the foundation but after you put the foundation down right and after you put the main floor on the foundation there's how many corners to a house, generally speaking? I'm not talking about these different ones. But how many corners? Four corners, right? And each one of those corners sets the pillars from the next level. Then you build in from there, okay? You build walls and you construct all the additions and everything, but you have to have your foundation, your base, and from there you construct four pillars. And you hope that when the house is done, those four pillars on that external part of the house and that foundation holds. Well. Christ is certainly our foundation, amen, when we talk about the church. So what are the pillars of the house? That's the title of this week's message, the four pillars of the house. And really, it's answering the question, how do we live? How do we make a home out of this? And I use the word home in more ways than one, not just as an illustration, but how do you make church be a home? How do you make it feel like home to those who are homeless, spiritually or otherwise? Because there's a lot of spiritual homeless out there with big, gigantic voids wondering if they have a spiritual place to live. What do they see when they come in the house? Do they feel invited? Do they feel welcome? Is this a place where they're going to be nourished and fed and grow? Or is this a place that's going to feel just as lonely as the outside? And so that's kind of the analogy that I want to work with and make sure that these I'm going to give us four pillars of the house. Make sure that, that these pillars are built on Jesus' dream for a house. Now, my wife, she made plans one time for us 
to have a house, you know, someday if she was to construct them. We never actually built it, okay? But it's fun to dream every once in a while, right? And Nick, I was actually amazed. I'm like, you could be an architect. She had these beautiful plans. She did them on blueprints. And I tried to reach, just try to design our own, right? And I took like some, you know, the back sheet of an eight by, by 11 piece of paper and, you know, hand sticks up. She had a blueprint down. She had the protractor, the ruler, the everything, right? And when it was done, it was, it was beautiful. I was like, wow, Nick, yours is a lot better than mine. Okay? But what is Jesus' dream for the house? Jesus is the foundation. He's the architect. He laid the groundwork for what needs to be built. What is his dream for the house? And, and how do we do something? Maybe, so there's certain things about the modern culture. There's certain things about the modern church culture that we can adapt and we can make our own. But maybe there's some things that we need to recapture. Maybe there's some things that, that maybe Jesus says, you know, this is my house. And don't forget these elements in it. So that's what I want to do with you today. That's where I'm hoping we can go. Again, it's not going to be a typical sermon style. It's not going to be super preachy. It's going to be more, let's cast a big visionary net. It's not going to have a lot of details. Everything's not going to get unpacked right here today. There's going to be more questions at the end than answers. But this is how I feel like I have to go with it on this particular message. Okay, number one. First pillar of the house. And it comes out of... Revelation 22.3. You can turn to it, or I'm just going to read it briefly. Revelation 22.3. This is, and, and I need to say this, because I almost forgot, that every single one of these four pillars of the house are going to point to forms where we can experience the kingdom life now and look forward to even a greater fulfillment of these pillars when the kingdom comes in full. That was the first message I preached to you. The kingdom is at hand even as we wait for it to come in full. That the life of the kingdom can be attained in certain aspects, even in a, in a temporary, even in a partial form until it comes. And that's what the church is. The church is the body of Christ that proclaims the kingdom is at hand and brings it to those without spiritual home, without a spiritual realm to live in and breathe in and thrive in. And so Revelation 22, 3 looks to the future, looks to the coming kingdom and says no longer will there be anything accursed. Wasn't that going to be a great day? Can, can we hardly wait for that time when there's no pain, no suffering, no feeling like life sometimes has a curse? You know, I, I think one of the hardest things in life was going through feeling like you're cursed, and then you realize, I mean, everybody, ah, here's no curse. You know what? There is a curse. Sin has brought a curse on this whole creation. I can't wait for the day that that's renewed. And, and the text says, but the throne of God. So no longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and of the Lamb, that being Jesus Christ, will be in it and his servants will worship him. Pillar number one, a healthy church worships the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When we get together here, this is a, a central aspect of church life. I'm not saying this is all the church life, and I want to get to that in a minute, okay? I'm not saying that this is what makes the church life all-encompassing, but we're going to start with what we're going to do for all eternity. When, when the Bible says all people of every nation, there is a place for a large group gathering to worship God, sing his praises, tell him how much we love him, sing a new song to him, pour out our heart to him, and tell him that he alone is worthy of the praises of his people. Amen? Amen. Amen. That's pillar number one. John Calvin, whether you like him or agree with him or not, okay, there's a lot of things I do like that he said. And one of the things he said that I found was very interesting is you will come to know God and not know of him where you might pop your head into a worship service, but to know him personally in an intimately, intimate way. You will know God first through the act of worship. That is the primary way that we first encounter God where we know him. If you look as soon as in the New Testament when Jesus healed somebody, what did they do? They fell on their knees and they worshipped him. There's an encounter that happens. We've been talking about it week after week after week. An encounter that happens in the context of worship. We're going to spend, listen, John, we're going to spend forever. And that's a long, long, long time. Worshipping God yeah. together. Yeah. So we ought to taste that kingdom right here and right now. 
I believe with all my heart that when we worship God together, as one lar however large this group grows to, I pray that it grows and that the doors get blown out. I pray that this barn can't hold us. I pray that uh, many prayers for this worship experience. But I pray that when we worship, it's not just, oh, I got to go do my, my religious duty. I pray that it's a chance to encounter and taste what is to come when paradise shows up. Amen. You ever look at worship that way? A taste of paradise. That's how worship should be. There should be people in here from all backgrounds, okay? All socioeconomic backgrounds, all racial backgrounds. You know why? Because one day that's what the kingdom's going to look like. And everybody's going to come together, and we get a chance to taste paradise when we do it here. So that is number one, an intimate experience of encounter, okay? And so while I want to start with that, Phil, I also want to say there is a, what I believe a modern cultural problem in, in, in church where that has now become the, it's not one pillar in a four-corner house. It's the one pillar in the middle, and it's, you know, it's the old school where the fireplace and the chimney goes up, and this is the whole pillar. And that's the whole of Christian life, where, where people can nominally and almost, uh, almost apathetically walk through the Christian existence just showing up one time for worship, which I appreciate, which I love, which is a taste of the kingdom now, and think that that is the entire Christian experience. It, brothers and sisters, is not the entire Christian experience. In our modern time, it is the central, almost, I would bet, in most cases, 90% of the budget. I would tell somebody tell me, in your personal life, look at your calendar and your checkbook, and I will be able, you let me look at I will be able to tell you what your number one priority is in your life. Churches can do the same thing. What do we value? We don't have a lot of money that we have to put into this place, which I'm thankful for. <laughs> but we're looking for something deeper. And, and here's, the, here's the wild thing, okay? In the New Testament, in the very beginning, the church was still part of Judaism. And where do you think they worshipped? Where did they go? Pastor Don just said it. Where, say it, Pastor Don. In the temple. So you know what? Going to worship didn't make them the church. They did it as the church, but it's not what defined them as the church. They were doing it with people who thought Jesus was an anathema. It's not. That worship experience didn't define and distinguish what it meant to be the church. It was part of being the church, but it wasn't the church. It was just part of their life. So why is that the kit and caboodle and the everything in our modern culture for the definition of the church if it wasn't from the beginning? Something else defined them. Something else distinguished them besides just going to worship at the temple. And that's where we're going to get to Acts 2, 42 through 46. For those of you who are here from a former church that I serve, you've heard me say this one uh, quite a few times. Quite a few times. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, that means the gathering of people, to breaking bread and praying together. And awe came upon every soul. Many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belonging, distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God. And I'll save the, the next line for a little later. Another pillar down the road for that last verse. But what made them the church, what distinguished them, was how they lived outside the worship of the temple. How they met in their homes. How they walked with Jesus with each other. How they, they went through the apostles' teaching and learned and grew and prayed for each other and broke bread in their homes and had hospitality for each other and built relationship with each other and the fellowship. That's what made them the church. And I think in a lot of the modern times, I don't mean to be judgmental, I'm certainly not going to call anyone out, we have it reversed where everything that defines us was where we go to the worship part, the large group one, which I don't want to undermine, nor do I want to trivialize all I'm saying is that's not how the early church was defined. So why is that the everything now? Something to think about. 
What's the word for fellowship? In the Greek, a lot of people know this, koinonia. Koinonia. It's over and over in the New Testament. It has another meaning, too, which we'll get to at another pillar. It's an important one. But that's what made them the church. So I'm not, I, I, I think large group, you know, large group worship, you know, it's wonderful. It's a, it's a central pillar. It's the first pillar. But there's got to be a second pillar. You just can't have fellowship. If we, if this place, if Encountering Ministries grows to 10,000 people, praise God. I'll be doing like Pastor Don says, the kippies, right? In the parking lot. I'll be excited. But if I don't know your name, it's tough to say we have the church's definition of koinonia. So how will we define ourselves as we grow? I think it's maybe the most central point you can get from today's message. It is not to trivialize this. It is to exacerbate how the church defines itself. Listen to this. Acts 12, through tw uh, Acts 12, 12. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark. That's John Mark, right? Where many were gathered together and were praying. In the home they were doing this. It's where they came to know each other. It's where they came to walk with Christ. Acts 16, 40. They went out of the prison and visited Lydia. And when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. Okay? They met in their homes. They broke bread together. Listen to how they define themselves. Not just in Jerusalem. Not just in Jerusalem did they say, hey, we're going to meet outside our worship center and, and meet in our homes together as well. But listen to the Gentile churches. Listen to Paul's words in Romans 16, 3 through 5. Greet Pisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus, who risked their necks for my life, to whom not only I give thanks, but all the churches of the Gentiles give thanks as well. Greet also the church in their house. Greet also the church in their house. Listen, that may well be that's just in Romans. What about Colossians? Give my greetings, Colossians 4.15. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea and to Nympha and the church in her house. Listen to Philemon 1 and 2. Paul, a prisoner for Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother. To Philemon, our beloved wor our fellow worker, and Aphi, our sister, and Equippus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your, guess what comes? House. House. I'm not saying that we have to be a house church, although, well, maybe I will. Just let me get there. Well, it doesn't seem you need to be. What I am saying is the church was built up and defined by how well they linked arms. All right? How well they linked arms. You know, one of the people that I feel the most like church with is my family, my parents, my wife. It feels like church. You know why? Because we walk it together. We have since I was this high. But there's something to be tasted for us together. To me, whether you're a house church or a 10,000 member church or whatever you are, it is the central way that the church define themselves as the church. This is where my heart's at. This is where my vision is. It's where church was lived out. Accountability, forgiveness, prayer, discipleship, hospitality, spiritual gifts. It's the place where kingdom life bloomed. We celebrate the kingdom life in worship and in praise as one large group, but we live it out when we leave here. If there's one thing I think has been the central, most damaging thing to the church, it is the concept that church is a building that you go to for an hour rather than a relationship with Almighty God and with each other where we grab hands and be the body of Christ and say, hey, we're brothers and sisters in arms coming at you because the kingdom of God is at hand. I'm going to share to you where my heart is. So number two is this kind of, for lack of a better word, small groups or group life, or however you want to call it. Small groups has its own connotations and means certain things to certain people. So I'm just going to say the fellowship. Fair enough? Worship, number one. Number two, the fellowship. Worship is where you first encounter God. Fellowship is where you first encounter one another. And it takes both pieces to experience the kingdom of God and be the church. Both pieces. Number three, expanding and witnessing this kingdom. And here's Acts 2, 47, the, the verse I, le out, I left off in this. 
and praising God. So remember, they're meeting, they're receiving their food with glad and generous hearts. They're giving to each other. They're learning what each other's struggling with. They're praying for each other. They're learning where each other has need. They're giving to each other. They're having fellowship. They're, they're, they're tending to lonely hearts. There's too many people who are lonely in the world today. And in this, listen to the last line, praising God and having favor with all the people. I want to stop before I even get to the next line. Why did they have such favor? Yeah, I believe they did miracles and witnessed it, but I believe that they had a life that was so attractive that people said, wow, I want to be part of that. And I believe there is a huge opportunity in the modern time for that type of kingdom life, for that type of church. Amen. Having favor with all the people and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. The church should grow. The church should be a witness, not just by what they say, but how they live. The biggest criticism of the church, which is sometimes given unfairly and sometimes used as an excuse by people who don't want to come to Christ, so I'm going to caveat that by saying it is, oh, well, it's your club that you do on this day a week, but I don't see a lot of people living it out. Now, I don't know that they really know that, but I do think we ought to be living it out. I think this is the biggest opportunity we have where we as brothers and sisters in the Lord have such a close, that, that people aren't lonely, that people don't have, they're not needy. Do you know how isolated this world is? We have, what is this called? Anybody tell me what this is called? So. No, but even, yes, but this type. What type is it? An iPhone. Okay? What do we have on our stands? The iPad, the i this, the i that. You go make a, a character on the Wii and it's called your me. Everything is so isolated. Everything is so individualistic. Everything is so virtual world where kids spend more time talking through a headset on a video game to somebody who's right across the street. Where's the rest of my kids? Can they hear me? Go embrace the guy who's right across the street from you. <laughs> But wow, do we have something to offer the world if we go and build the church by Jesus' dream and Jesus' vision. Expanding and witnessing the kingdom. I told you koinonia has two meanings. And here's the thing. It takes two English words, a lot of you have heard me say this before, to make that one Greek word. And whenever it means fellowship, it also means participation. So if you look in different translations, some will say fellowship, and some will say, like in the beginning of chapter 2 of Philippians, okay, that they had participation in the Spirit. It's a grab at hands of being on a mission together. I think one of, the, one of the greatest analogies and illustrations of this is from the movie Lord of the Rings, where they're gathering at this council, and I don't know the terms, I can't get Elrond and Accolade and Anadu and everything, I don't know all those names, I can't get them all down. Okay? But I think it was the Council of Elrond or something like that. They're all gathered around, and they got to bring this ring back to destroy evil and throw it in the fire. Okay? And nobody wants to do it. They say, this is an impossible task. And the smallest member, the smallest, the weakest one says, I will do it, but I don't know the way. And the background on this is they were all going to fight each other. I'm not taking it. The elves should take it. The dwarves should take it. The, this person, they were ready to go to arms. And as soon as this small, weak kid says, I'll take the ring back. I just don't know the way. All of a sudden, you look and you see these people got it. And they said, well, then you have my axe. And you have my sword. And you have my bow. And all of a sudden, they were bonded, and they had koinonia. They had fellowship because they were participating in something together that is beyond themselves. Amen. I had an opportunity to speak at Springfield College to their football program. And this was the message that I gave them. You have to, you have to believe and be a, If you want to be a team, you need to believe and be a part of something <laughs> and participate in something that is beyond yourself. And if church ever becomes about just feed me and let me get myself on, this is my I church. <laughs> if we get into the I church, there goes that pillar. And before that pillar's done, the other one will come. Because then you know what comes after that? After that pillow fa pillar falls, comes my small group didn't really, you know, they didn't, I asked that we could do this and they didn't do it. And then that pillar falls. And all of a sudden, well, you know, the preacher, I didn't really resonate with the sermon today. It was okay. I don't know. I might go try someone. And then that pillar falls. And you just go right down. Jesus says in Luke 13, 18 through 19, What is the kingdom of God like, and what shall I compare it? It is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his garden, and it grew and became a tree, and the birds of the air made nests in its branches. 
brothers and sisters, I think there are some birds in the air who are tired of the I world. And we ought to be a tree or a house whose branches or pillars provide nests for people to come and find life again. Can you amen that for me? Yeah. Expanding. You're equipped. I said it when we talked about the Holy Spirit. As the Father sends me, Jesus says, I am sending you. Why? Why is he sending you equipped and empowered through the Holy Spirit? Because he wants this mustard seed to grow. So yes, I pray that it grows. But I pray that it goes healthy. So that's pillar one. Pillar two. There's pillar three. What's the fourth pillar? i got to go through this quickly because we got a fireside chat about to come. Discipleship is the fourth pillar. I've used that term to talk about developing leaders, leadership development. I've used it to talk about growing your faith. I've used it to talk about developing people to be equipped, right? You know, it's funny, it's the New Testament understanding of leaders, pastors, elders, is that they are supposed to train the other people so that all can participate in the ministry together. All the saints will be built up for the life and ministry of the church. I think discipleship is probably the most central component of any church because it's what Jesus did. What a crazy idea. Can we just talk about that? I'm getting ready for my fireside chat. I need a chance. Can we just talk about this for a minute? What a concept to take these band of people who really basically flunked out of rabbis, of the rabbinical school. Okay? Some of you may have seen Rob Bell do a, a video of Rusk on this, whether you like Rob Bell or not, doesn't matter. This video was good. Where what you did is you came up, you had to study, you had to memorize the whole Pentateuch, it's the first five Bibles, uh, first five books of the Bible, and then you went and you and you memorized another large section, <coughs> then another large section, so you could memorize it. And the best of the best were able to follow a rabbi and be called their disciple. And here comes Jesus, who goes to people who are fishermen, which means they what? They didn't make the cut. They didn't go to the next level. That's what you did. If you, if you weren't the best of the best, you went back to the family trade. And he takes those people and says, you, come on, you're going to be my disciples. And then he does even a wilder thing than that. He starts sending them out and I want you to do what I'm doing. Because that's what a disciple wanted to do. I want to do what my rabbi does. That's what he's training me for. And then Jesus goes and ascends to the Father after he dies and says, guess what? Persecution's coming. Guess what? People are going to hate you because of me. Get at it and grow this mustard seed. Wow. That's wild. And you know what? They do it. Not just the 12 apostles. The disciples. People who follow their rabbi. The same ones that Jesus says, and not just these ones here, but all the ones who believe on account of me. Make disciples of 12 apostles. No. As Pastor Brown would say, eh. Make disciples of the 72 disciples that I left. And make disciples of all nations. You are a disciple of a rabbi. And that rabbi trains us and equips us and empowers us to do what he does. That's why I talked about oneness with Christ. That's why I talked and led this point. There's a reason I went in this order about being empowered and equipped by the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus has a mission for us. And Paul picks it up. And he says to Timothy, so I'm mentoring you, Timothy, as it was entrusted to me, I entrust to you, you entrust it to other faithful men. So four pillars of the house, worship, group life, expanding and witnessing the kingdom, and discipleship and developing ourselves as leaders, maturing in the faith. Those, in my opinion, are the four most central aspects of the church in the New Testament. And I think you can do more than that and be a church, but I'm not so sure that we can do less than that and be called a church. Not by Jesus. Not, in, not when I look at Jesus' blueprint and architecture. That, to me, is the church. It's not the building. It's not the hour. It's the life. It's good news. Gospel. Evangelion. The kingdom is at hand. And every one of those things, growth in Christ and his likeness, kingdom growing, 
the intimacy that we have with God and with each other, worship, every one of those things will mature in full when the kingdom comes. But God willing, let us taste those pillars now. Amen. And not cut one away. Do you feel me on this? Do you feel what I'm saying? That's the vision for church. All right. Fireside chat. I don't know if I can sit. I just can't do it. I got you. I just gave to you what I believe about the church. An encounter with the triune God and with each other that produces worship, group life, growing the kingdom and discipleship. How will we do it? Witnessing the gospel and leadership development, discipleship, those are things we will do along the way. I'm not going to talk about specific structures. Those are things that you do along the way. We learn how to share our faith. We learn how to witness for Christ. We learn how to make encounters for the kingdom. We learn to, dis to disciple and to grow and to disciple others. We'll get to those as we unpack this for however long the Lord blesses this ministry. But the other two, where do we start? The small group intimate life and the large group worship celebration. What will that look like here? I'm going to start with worship and the word. I told you, I, let, I gave you a little hint. This here, this is our tent meeting, barn raising, revival style. God, come on down. This is on a different night. It's all some of you are involved in other churches. God bless you. I'm glad you're here. I hope nobody takes offense to that. I really do. It's got to be a place. You know, one day we're all going to worship together, right? And if this is just about me or Pastor Don, well, then be offended. But it's not. It can't be. It shouldn't be. It ought not to be. You have a chance, whether you're involved in another church, whether you've never been to a church, whether you don't even know what you believe. Come on in. Come on in and let's worship. Let's ask God to encounter us. We have... Fireside chat, I promise. I'm getting, I'm getting preachy, I know it. It's ecumenical here. It's sensitive to seekers and people that don't know the Lord. That's what we're trying to do. It's almost revivalist style here. Okay, it's not going to be a Bible study here. A couple questions we have to ask, and I debated whether to just throw this out there, but I'm going to. Okay, so the sermon, if you're clocking me here, the sermon's over. Now we're just doing a fireside chat. Is Saturday night the best? Maybe. Certainly a chance for people from all different walks and backgrounds, believers and unbelievers, to come and experience something here. Maybe it's best. Maybe it's hard to come on Saturday nights because there's so much going on. It's right in the middle of the weekend. I don't know. We just threw this together. We said, hey, let's do it. We got this time. This time works. Let's just start something and see where it goes. And here we are. We also have the issue of space. We have had... Over the last few weeks, 50, 40, you know, the place holds 70, <coughs> maybe 75. We're getting cozy. We have to be out for the Big E. Can't be in here for the Big E. Except the 29th, and I hope everybody comes on the 29th because they're giving us the chapel. And we are going to light the biggie up. People will be walking by their cotton candy singing, Holy is nice. the Lord. God <laughs> um, you know, that's what we want. I want some I want some young seven year old kid who doesn't even go to church to have a big cotton candy singing Holy is the Lord because he hears us blaring it out. So come on the 29th, please. But other than that, we've got a good month. We can't be here. I don't know if you noticed, but the place is not really conducive for air conditioning and heat and the winter's coming. Winter's coming. What do we do about that? I don't know. We racked our brains the other night until we wanted to choke each other. I don't know. I'm just going to throw it out there. I didn't even know if I should, but I am. I just want this, as I'm asking you to pray about this with us. I, I'm going to give a caveat. Every time you, you ask for opinions, people give it, and if you don't go with it, they say, well, what would you ask me for? Listen, I'm going to seek God in this. Pastor Don's going to seek God in this. Everybody's not going to get their way. It's, it's, not, it, that's not, it's not about me. It's not about him. And it's not about you. It's about him and what's going to work. But I'm asking you to pray about that. Is Saturday night the best? Is Sunday night at, is the best? Sunday night's okay too sometimes, but sometimes we were getting ready for the week and they're winding down. 
maybe earlier, Sunday at 5, I don't know. People still have their weekend, I don't know. I just wanted to think, when do you think a revival-style, ecumenical, seeker-friendly, uh, tent, barn-raising type of atmosphere, what we do is best? Is it Saturday night? Is it uh, Sunday morning? Is it Sunday night? There's going to be a questionnaire coming around. Sign that. Next. <coughs> We are going to define, if I say to you that people from other churches who come as an ecumenical thing just on a Saturday night or a Sunday night or whenever we do it to worship God together, <coughs> this is not how I define us as a church. It's part of what we do as a church. It's a pillar of the house, but it's not the definition. We are going to define our church by the, the koinonia, by the fellowship and the participation, membership, communion. Those are going to happen in group life. They're going to be called church groups. What are they going to look like? I don't know. I don't even know how many people are interested in them. If there's two people, well, okay. Maybe there'll be one group, and we'll find out the best time. I don't know what it's going to look like. But that's how we're going to define church. This is going to be what we do. It's going to be a place for all the different churches. My dream, and i got to share my dream, my dream is that there's an Agawam church group and a West Springfield church group and an East Long Meadow church group and a Chicopee church group and a South Hadley church group and a Granby church group and an Amherst church group and a Westfield church group. And then when it comes time for celebration, we come and we fill this place or whatever place we're at and we all come to worship together and people say, oh man, I can almost taste the kingdom coming. That's my hope. That's what we're, we're envisioning. If you're already part of a church, great, come and join us on these celebrations. But our membership, our participation, our communion is going to happen in these groups, these church group lives. And that's what we're looking to do. And so if you're interested in that, guess what? There'll be another survey going around. We have a pen. Fill it out. Pastor Don and I will be teaching them. <coughs> and I think we can fill and as much need as there is, and then as they grow, our hope is to develop people. You know, Maybe what's preached on on a, on a Saturday night or a Sunday night or whenever we do this, will then get flushed out with the groups, and they'll talk about it, they'll talk about, hey, what did that mean to you, or what did this verse that was said mean to you, and how do we walk this through, and they'll pray for each other, and they'll pray Fred together, and they'll commune together, and you know what? They'll feel that kind of, <sighs> So that's the dream. Listen, there's gonna be two things that are, <coughs> Here. Somewhere else. We run a little late today. You have to forgive me. We combined a message and a fireside chat and vision all in one. This one here. I am interested in being part of one of the churches Encountering, encountering Ministry is forming. It's worded properly. One of the churches Encountering Ministry is forming. Those, those words are intentional. You can put your name, your hometown, and the best way to contact you. The next one says, worship preference time. Please rank them one through four. Saturday night, 6.30 to 7.30. Sunday morning, which will cut the ecumenical piece out. I'm going to tell you, may not be the strongest one from my point of view. And Sunday night, like 6 to 7 or 5 to 6. There's an other category. You can write other. You say Tuesday night at 10 o'clock at night, probably not going to be a place for the big celebration. Maybe a small group. Good luck. I probably won't leave it, but you know, right there. Four different ones, and just rank them. You could put one, two, three at the top, or you could put other and put number one by the other. They're going to be here, and there's a couple pens. I don't know <coughs> what it will look like yet because I've racked my brain for a month going back and forth. What's the best night? What are we going to do when the big E comes? How many people will we have? What type of other place do we need? Do we just get a hotel conference room for a couple weeks and then come back to the barn? What happens when the winter comes? We don't have a ton of resources. We can't pay a ton for a place. Round and round and round. All I have is vision for you right now. And my heart for the gospel and the church. And that's where we'll start. So, during the next two songs, pray as you sing. Pray as you worship. Let me know if the Lord gives you something. Come talk to us afterwards. I'd love to just sit down and, and hear it. Who knows what the Spirit of God will do today, tomorrow, next week? I don't know. Let's pray. God, I feel like I kind of went out on a limb here. Um, 
hope it makes sense. But those pillars, well, Father, you and I have been talking about those for a while now. How I long to see that vision of church, because I do believe that was your vision, Jesus. I see you doing it. I see you developing people. I see you going to people's homes, Peter's home, everybody's home, being the church, forming this thing, connecting with people, meeting them, not only their physical needs, their emotional needs. <coughs> and oh Lord, how we love to come together all as one body in worship. Guide this process. I'm inviting this whole group and anybody watching online, anywhere into this process to pray. If it doesn't go the way somebody wants, but they can still participate, Lord, help us all to shelve our pride. Help us to grab hands and long to be a team, a church. A church even connected with other churches. <coughs> Break down the walls that divide us. Help us march through proclaiming good news. Great news. The kingdom of God is at hand.